I know I've said this a few times, but we're actually ready. And so again, I want to introduce myself. My name is Stuart Schlossman, and welcome to MS Views and News, first program outside the state of Florida. We chose Atlanta for a reason. Vicki Pomeroy. She's been hocking me for years to come up here and do a program. Okay? Many of you know Vicki, many don't. You'll hear her later on as well. But I, I want to thank Vicki. And then, of course, we came across with another theory that we're going to do. We're going to start a theme of how we do programs outside the state of Florida. And the next area that we want to do is a place called Birmingham, maybe. Something with a B. And then something with a C, Charlotte. And then we'll look for an E town, because there's a medication that begins with an E. Do you get where I'm going here with this? The next one will be an R, and then a T. And then we'll go and we'll flip around and go and we'll go to AGT again. All right? But the, we don't, I'm not going to say anything. But anyway, but that's the whole theme behind all this, is that we're going to go around and get around and get outside of Florida doing programs as well, outside the state by just going to towns or cities that begin with the names of the drugs. And that will be our theme of how we're getting outside. Before I go any further, I want to thank those that enabled us to do this program today. Genzyme, a Santa Fe company, for their unrestricted educational grant, and I want to thank them, and I hope you all do too. <laughs> QuestCore Pharmaceutical, for their charitable contribution. Biogen IDEC, Genzyme again, Novartis, Bayer Healthcare, QuestCore Pharmaceuticals again, they all take part in helping us with different types of sponsorship. Teva Neuroscience, and I have to thank the Teva rep for the local area, because he gave us the projector to use today. So thumbs up to you back there. Thank you. I want to thank all of our volunteers that came from the local area to help out today, as well as a cousin of mine that came down from Charlotte, and friends that came in from Fort Mill, South Carolina, because they know that they've heard the types of programs that we're doing in Florida, and we want to be able to do this. The pharmaceutical companies want us to get out there and start bringing our programs that we're doing in Florida out to the rest of the United States because they know and they see the amount of people that are attending our programs. We average 70 people per program. That's a great thing. Why are we averaging this? I have no idea. Maybe it's the reminders. Did anybody get a reminder for this program? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and remember, my brother told me to smile, remember? So here, there, it's just for you, Eric. I'm smiling. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have a lot going on. As I told you all before, we are doing this live stream. This is our second time we're doing a live webcast. We did it in Miami, Florida at the end of September. We had an audience, an overall audience between people that were there and people watching. We were close to 500 people for our audience. Today's event, I'm sure we're going to be near to the same thing now that we got everything working online. Right, Bill? There you go. He lost a lot of hair over that in the last few minutes. <laughs> so, today's program, again, we're doing it as a live webcast. For those that want to watch it later on or watch any of the programs we've done in the past, we have a YouTube channel. It's just simply youtube.com slash msviewsandnews. Very simple. Okay, so you go to that and you'll be able to find the programs that we've taped in the past and you'll be able to look at the live webcast that we did a couple of months ago, and you'll have access to this as well. Again, many of you were expecting a certain person to be here today, that person being Dr. Ben Thrower. And Dr. Ben Thrower could not be here today. And Dr. Ben Thrower asked me to make an announcement, but I asked him to write it out and send it to me. And so I'm going to read you his message. As some of you may know, his son, Sam, is undergoing treatment for acute myeloid leuke leukemia. When this program was planned, it was hoped that Sam would be finished with chemotherapy. Sam is undergoing treatment and is headed toward now a bone marrow transplant. As such, Dr. Thrower could not be here today, but he entrusted a person that he knew would do as good of a job as himself to be here and work with us and broadcast to the community today, and that be Tracy Walker, his longtime nurse practitioner. I heard Tracy years ago. She did a program in Florida, and I loved her then. So when Dr. Throw asked me if I know her, whew, that was great. I was happy. Thank you for coming. Yesterday, just so you all know, Sam had a biopsy for his uh, bone marrow 
as well as something else. I don't remember exactly what it is. They're hoping for good information to come from this. They'll have their results in about a week. For the next 10 seconds, I would like you all, everywhere, please just think good thoughts for Sam. Thank you, everybody. Going forward again, I spoke earlier about raffle items. Yes, I know you're here for those raffles. Okay? We have Polar Products, who's one of MSVU's new sponsors, gives us pr products to raffle off at our programs. They know that you all need it. Yeah, maybe not this time of year. It's cool enough, right? But uh, they gave us a cooling vest and some cooling wrist bracelets for you to get as well. We also have the Marriott that we're doing this program at today gave us a lunch or dinner certificate for two. Of course, you know, we have the Android tablet because I know that that's what drew a lot of you people here. Um, and we have a few other things. We have shirts and whatnot. And again, during the course of the program, we will give this out. I'm, again, I'm supposed to smile. <laughs> Here we are. Okay? I'm smiling. All right. So, again, let's go a little bit further here. MSVUs and News, the reason why this all began, when I was diagnosed in 1998 with multiple sclerosis, I couldn't find information. I didn't know where to get it. A lot of you probably understand what I'm talking about. And so, being internet savvy at that time, I got on the internet and I started up looking up, looking up information for myself. Then I got involved with a support group, and people there didn't know where to find out information. So they heard what I was doing, they asked me to look up the information. What started off with just sending emails to people in that one support group, five people, then other support group leaders started finding out about it, and they asked me to send the information to them for, them to, for they to use with their groups. And so that began like that. Now people in 98 countries are receiving our information. We have a board of directors. Most of those on our board of directors also have multiple sclerosis. We ask the MS community all the time to help us determine what kind of programs we could do in the future. At one time, we only knew to have a neurologist. Now we have a neurologist or a nurse practitioner and a second speaker, maybe an occupational therapist, maybe a personal trainer, maybe a neuro-ophthalmologist, a urologist, a psychologist, many different choices that we have, and we bring those types of second uh, speakers to all of our programs, and it's quite important. And by the way, I need to also thank not just my volunteers and everybody and the sponsors that are here today, but all of you need a round of applause for being here today, too, because this is a great, great showing that we have here today. We have a wonderful audience here, and again, I'm thankful for you all being here. We're going to let each of our support group leaders that are here today speak for about 90 seconds. Why? Because I like to get them involved. Everywhere we do a program, we like to have support group leaders get involved with what we're doing, makes them feel like they're part of MS Views and News, and we want them to know how important we know that you are for the MS community. So we're going to ask a few of these support group leaders to come up here today, speak for 90 seconds each. It's going to be done quickly. All right, and then we're going to let Vicky speak for a few minutes, and then we're going to get started in this program. So first up, to Wanda. And by the way, I have to stand right next to her because she's miked to me. Just remain standing. Here you go. Would you like that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tawanda Cooper, and I am the self-help leader of uh, the Bartow County MS Support Group. We're located in Cartersville. We meet at the IHOP um, every fourth Thursday of the month, and we meet at 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And if you're in our neck of the woods, stop on by. Thank you, thank you Tawanda. That was great. Next, we have Zeta, Zaida. Both ways. I don't want to make a joke from that. You want me to hold it and this? Both? Go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Because I need to hold my paper. Thank you. Hi. I am Zeta Jacob. I'm the leader of the Woodstock 
club in, um, in Woodstock. Uh, we have four co-leaders, and I'm very honored about that. And uh, we have over 30 members in our, in our association there. Um, I have to say how proud I am of everyone in my support group. They are diversified, well-educated, of all ages, and various stages of MS. They are always in good spirits. When occasionally one is going through a tough time, that's when we realize how blessed we are. People who can care to listen and absolutely understand what you're going through. This is our, our Woodstock self-help group. I want to quote a couple of people in my, in my club, and I had to really cut this down. Johnny and Regina, we welcome to the, we, we come to the meeting each month because we are uplifted by, by all the others there. It's a great time of fellowship. We have Sonia, my co-leader, that says, I come to the group because I don't have to explain myself. Everyone understands. And Maritza, our new member, says what I like best about the group is that they are like a big family and everyone cares about each other. Rob says, I've met some wonderful people in this group who are going through the same thing I am. And finally, Lisa, my other co-leader, I come to the meeting because I need to feel connected to and to know that I am not alone in this disease. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Zeta Zaida. And now we're going, I'm going to ask Vicki Pomeroy. By the way, I almost didn't make it here yesterday. We had a flight that was supposed to be a full flight, 757, 200 and something people on board, I don't know exactly. And they decide, just as we're getting ready to board, that they have a latch broken on the plane. They can't close the cargo hold. What are they gonna do with us? They wanted us to wait till either a, a red-eye flight or fly out the next morning. Yeah, right. I was gonna need to rent a car and drive here at 90 miles an hour. So anyway though, the pilot decides that he's gonna come out and speak with everybody. And he says, I want you all to know we could do this. We just gotta get rid of all the luggage and we could fly at 10,000 feet straight across. I wasn't happy. And he says it could get very bumpy up there, like a roller coaster. And I knew I wasn't happy. I am not one for roller coasters. But, you know, the medical community makes things, made it easy for me to get on that plane. And so I was on that plane. And thankfully, they got rid of all of our luggage. We left late. Our luggage was put onto a flight that was supposed to leave an hour after us. But actually, our luggage arrived in Atlanta 10 minutes before us. Great service. Didn't even have to wait at the conveyor belt waiting for it. So anyway, that was my story from yesterday. I just thought I'd share that with you. Flew at 10,000 feet. We're able to see the ground. Could even see people waving. <laughs> Who expects a huge jet like that to be so low? It was like being in a little private plane. Vicki, come on over, please. I hope everybody knows how important self-help group leaders are. Very, very important, and this is why we have to have them. Thank you. Do I need both? Four minutes. Less than that. Good morning. I really want to thank you all for coming out today. You all have no idea how important it is that we get together for these educational seminars. We need to reach out to each other and work together. But today, you're reaching out and you're educating and empowering yourselves. For years, you always hear me say, knowledge is power, knowledge is power. If you want to control this disease, you've got to know everything that you can possibly know about this disease. But this educational program today that's offered by Stu is very different from the ones you're used to. We're not gonna tell you about one drug or one treatment. We're gonna tell you about everything that's out there that we know of. That gives you choices. But today, you're gonna to go home and you're gonna feel smarter. You're gonna feel stronger and proud of yourselves, I hope, because today, you took the first step in bettering your own lives. 
Now, I run the support group out of Snellville, Georgia. This past summer, we celebrated our 25th anniversary together. Thank you. Um, I also produce a monthly newsletter known as The Explorer. Um, the Explorer currently goes out to six different continents and 83 countries. I'm not as well spread as Stu is. But if you do not receive the Explorer, please give me your email address or your stale mail address today and I'll put you on my mailing list. But again, I want to thank you all for showing up today. Today, you took your power and you used it for your betterment and I'm very proud of you all. Thank you. Very good. And my, and my sincere thanks to Vicki as well because again, I would not have made the step to get out of Florida and to come up here to to start doing what we need to do by getting out of the state. Um, by the way, when we finish this year, we'll have done 31 programs this year between Florida and this being our first out of state. Again, I average, we average, MSU the News averages about 70 patients per program. That's a fantastic thing. We've only been doing this less than four years, and we now are approaching, when this year ends, we'll have done 90 programs in less than four years. So our aim, our goal is just to educate. Our speaker, our speaking arrangement today, for those that didn't know, we're going to have Julie Herbin, did I say that correctly? Here from Shepherd Center. And Julie, for those that don't know, is an occupational therapist. She's an OT and rehab for MS. And so now I'm gonna ask Julie to come on over and take the mic from her. So that way I can get her slideshow up and running. As Stuart said, my name is Julie Herbin. I'm an occupational therapist at the Shepherd Center. I've been there for six years, and I work in the outpatient MS rehab department. And today, we're gonna to talk about energy conservation in MS during the holidays, as well as use of adaptive equipment. So if you are here today, you probably either have MS or maybe you have a family member or a loved one that has MS. So a lot of you are probably fairly familiar with all of the potential symptoms that can occur in MS. But you could see at the top of the list, I have starred fatigue and that's the symptom that we're gonna focus in on today. So fatigue is considered the most common symptom of MS, affecting over 80% of the MS population. And when we talk about true MS fatigue, we're talking about an unexpected, overwhelming, whole body tiredness that is not relieved by sleep and usually gets worse as the day goes on. Whereas general tiredness is an expected feeling after certain activities or at the end of the day. Unfortunately, the real cause of fatigue is unknown, but luckily it, it can be managed and controlled. So there are many factors that can impact fatigue. Being deconditioned or just having a sedentary lifestyle in general can affect your endurance, making you feel fatigued quicker. Certain medications can have a side effect of feeling sleepy. Um, depression can also lead to feelings of fatigue. So it's important to make sure you're having good communication with your doctors and letting them know what your symptoms are if you're changing medications or tweaking them. Interrupted sleep, whether it be because you have pain or you're having worry, or maybe you're getting up several times a night to go to the bathroom, you're probably waking up feeling tired and that can lead to fatigue during the day. Lack of nutrition, are you eating enough? Are you getting enough nutrients, staying hydrated? If you're not, that can make you feel fatigued and tired as well. And then certain lifestyle issues, Maybe your house is not accessible. Maybe you are a single parent and have small children, and maybe you don't have a lot of family support or friends that live nearby. So if you're doing all of that yourself, that's gonna be a lot more energy consuming. Stress, whether it's positive or negative, can def definitely impact fatigue. And then finally we have heat, whether it be from hot showers, exercising, or just being out 
in the sun, that can definitely exacerbate symptoms of MS. So we're gonna talk a little more in detail about managing heat intolerance. So there are a variety of different cooling equipment out there, such as cooling vests, headbands, wristbands, scarves. Use of fans can be helpful just with getting the airflow in the room. A ambient temperature settings, so for instance in your house, you can try and set the temperature where it's comfortable for you. Looking at the time of day, so maybe going outside more earlier in the morning or later in the evening when the sun goes down, especially during the summertime. Staying hydrated with cold slushy drinks and layering with light clothing so that if you do get hot, you can take off a layer. Rest breaks out of the heat are important, even if it's in the shade for a few minutes, but more ideally in an air conditioning room for a couple minutes. Cool showers can help. And then taking rest breaks when you're exercising or just doing a lot of activity in general. All right, when we talk about management of fatigue, a term you will often hear is the use of energy conservation, which refers to the reduction in the amount of energy consumed by a person achieved through rational or practical use. And when we talk about managing energy or monitoring our energy, a good way to think about that is by way of a money bank. So your money bank equaling your energy bank. So you have a certain amount of money throughout the day or during a day and you're gonna make several deposits and withdraws throughout the day. You wanna make sure you're not using up all your money or your energy throughout the day and reserving money or energy for activities later on in the day or just leisure activities that you enjoy. All right, so some basic tips for managing your energy or your money bank. We have the five Ps. So the first P is planning. So you wanna to try to keep a calendar and make a schedule of your week's events, appointments, or anything you have to do that week, and making sure that you organize proper rest periods within that week. You wanna spread your errands out throughout the week and be realistic. So for example, if you had two doctor's appointments scheduled one afternoon, you probably wouldn't wanna do a lot of heavy household tasks that morning before you leave. Number two is prioritizing. So what tasks have to be done and what tasks are important to you? So you wanna make a priority list and also delegate to others things that may be more difficult for you, like heavier tasks such as taking out the garbage or doing the lawn, something that's a lot more energy consuming. All right, the third P is pacing. So you wanna balance activity and rest breaks. And you wanna complete the most difficult tasks during the day, time of day when you're feeling your best, which is usually in the morning. Try not to rush through activities and complete a task before starting another one. So if you're, for example, cooking in the kitchen or baking, you probably don't wanna leave the kitchen until you get the item out of the oven um, so you don't forget about it. Number four, posture and position. Using good posture and body mechanics is important when sitting or standing just to help with efficient breathing um, and it also helps with functional reach. Ergonomic setup, like if you use a computer a lot, you wanna make sure that you're at a good body mechanical position that the computer's right in front of you and you don't have to strain your eyes to look at the computer or strain your arms to reach the keyboard. And then avoid staying in one position for too long, especially when you're standing. So shift your weight side to side. That'll take some of the strain off your joints. And then sit as much as you can while you're working. So for example, sit maybe when you're folding laundry or when you're um, doing, completing meal prep task. And then the final P is power labor savings devices, which is also referred to or called adaptive devices or equipment. Adaptive devices refers to all the tools 
products and devices that can make functioning easier in the categories of mobility, dressing, grooming and bathing, self-feeding and meal prep, and communication. So there are a ton of different adaptive devices and equipment out there, but in the next few slides, we're just gonna look at some of the most common basic ones that we use. Um, and I have some equipment that I brought. I'll show a little bit during this presentation and then at the end of the presentations, um, I can show you more maybe in the back of the room. So starting with mobility, first is a shower or tub chair or bench. This can help in conserving energy while you're completing bathing tasks, as well as promoting safety. Grab bars can be helpful in pulling yourself up off the toilet or pulling yourself up off of a tub or shower chair. Use of a power or electric wheelchair or scooter can help with conserving energy if you're going longer distances. And then use of a wheeled walker, rollator, or cane can be helpful because it takes the weight off of your legs. Uh, a rollator would probably be the best option just because it has the seat component. So you can lock your brakes and turn around and sit and take a break whenever you need to. And then at the bottom we have orthotics. So this is a picture of um, an AFO, which is an ankle foot orthosis. And basically this just kind of comes underneath your sneaker and it props your foot up if you have weakness in the ankle or you have foot draw or difficulty picking your, your toe up. So you can save energy that way. For adaptive devicing, devices for dressing, first there we have a sock aid, which is right here. So a sock aid can be helpful in putting your socks on without having to lean over to reach your feet or bring your foot up over your knee and strain your back. So basically you put the sock on here and then you can, you hold the, the, the strings here and you bring it down to your foot and you pull on and the sock, the sock literally comes right on. It's really, really a cool device. A reacher, A reacher can be helpful in dressing, but also in many other functional tasks. To pick things up off the floor, or pick things up overhead, as long as they're not too heavy. Um, I think a grabber is really good for everyone to have for many uses. All right, next we have a long-handled shoehorn, which I'm sure everyone has seen or has. But basically this helps bring your heel into the shoe without the heel of the shoe folding in. And then finally we have elastic laces and Velcro as an alternative to traditional laces so that you don't have to worry about tying and untying or worrying about them becoming untied on their own. With grooming, we have a long-handled sponge and this can be helpful in reaching your back, reaching your legs when you're bathing, so you don't have to strain and lean over so much. A bath mitt is basically a washcloth that comes around your hand like a mitten. So if you have weakness in the fingers, you don't have to worry about picking up the soap. You can kind of soap up the mitten and just kind of use that as your, as your washcloth. Long-handled or angled combs or brushes, they can be helpful with grasp, so your hands aren't slipping and you have a better grasp on the handle. And then the angle can help so that you don't have to bring your hand so high up like this. You can probably bring it more like this and it'll reach the back of your hair. Adaptive toothbrush or an electric toothbrush can be helpful if you have weakness in the hands. Um, there's a built-up grip on both of them so you have more stabilization of the toothbrush. And with an electric toothbrush, you have, basically it does it for you, so you don't have to move your, your hand. It usually just kinda does all the work for you. So pill boxes. 
Pill boxes minimizes the amount of time that you have to open and close your pill box because normally you're doing it once a week. And then also it keeps your pills organized so that you're not looking for the pills or you're not using energy trying to remember if you took them. All right, moving on to feeding. The first picture is a picture of a plate guard, which is a little piece of plastic that attaches to the plate in order for you to stab food without it falling off the plate. Built up handled utensils or knives can assist with grasp and just gives you more control in general when you're stabbing food. The next is a picture of a U-cuff, and basically this is a piece of material that's wrapped around the palm of your hand with a little pocket in it, and you can put a fork or a spoon or anything in there that you're using to feed yourself, and essentially feed yourself independently without having to use your fingers at all. A sippy cup and a long straw makes it easier because it has a handle and a lid, and the long straw can help so that you don't have to bring your head all the way to the to a small straw or to the cup, and you don't have to bring the cup all the way up to your mouth. Dyson is a kind of a non-slip, sticky kind of material. Sometimes you use it in, in shelves for shelf lining, but it can be helpful in stabilizing plates or cups or bowls. so that they're not moving around on you. Thanks. <laughs> and then finally, an electric can or jar opener is gonna be much more energy conserving than using a manual one. All right, moving on to communication. We have pictures of adaptive writing utensils and there are a variety of different built-up handled writing utensils that can make it much easier to grasp your, your pen and control your pen when you're writing. A wand chick is a piece of flexible metal with plastic around it that basically attaches to your hand and there's a place, there's a place for your finger and a place for the pen and it puts your, your hand in a really good natural writing position but you're really not having to use your, your fingers very much. So it's good for difficulty with fine motor and finger weakness. Next we have the U-cuff again that we showed in the prior slide with the right angle pocket. So you put the U-cuff on, but instead of putting the spoon in like we showed in the prior slide, you would put in a right angle pocket with a pen in it. And then you can adjust the angle to where you want the pen. And again, you essentially don't have to use your fingers at all for writing. A typing aid is a plastic piece of material that goes around the palm below the, the knuckles. And then there's an extra piece of material that extends right past your fingers. And you can use that to type if you have, if you have difficulty with controlling your fingers when you're typing. And then finally, we have there are voice activated systems out there now for your computer or for your cell phone, such as Dragon or Surrey, and I know there's a lot of other ones out there too, and that can make it easier so you don't have to do all the typing. You can just um, talk. <laughs> all right, so as we all know, the holiday season is coming up and it can be a very fun and enjoyable time of year, but also it can be a very busy and energy consuming time of year. So we wanted to really just touch on energy conservation specific to the holidays. So the categories are shopping, decorating, family visits, meal prep, and traveling. All right, so for shopping, you always want to use lists and bring them into the store with you so you know what you're getting, you remember what you need to get. Try and shop during less busy hours, so maybe during the week or early in the morning when the stores first open. 
You want to try and shop in familiar stores if you can, so you have an idea of where everything is in that store. Use of assistive devices or scooters can be helpful, especially if you're shopping for longer periods of time. Bringing someone along is always helpful. They can help reach items for you or carry items for you. And then you want to take advantage of any stores that have free wrapping, because that definitely saves you from having to do it later. If you do have a lot of items that you have shopped for and you're, after you check out, you can always ask the store employee to assist in carrying the items to your car and loading it into the car. And then online shopping is always an option if you're just kind of overwhelmed and if you don't like to shop during the busy season, sometimes it's a lot easier to do online shopping. And the other advantage to this is that if you're mailing something to somebody, you can go online and just directly have it sent to that person. With decorating, you want to make sure you're starting early enough. Do just a little bit at a time. Get help if you need it, especially with decorations that are heavier or if there's something that needs to be hung. You want to try and use and buy lightweight decorations as this is much easier to manage in general. And then use of an artificial tree is easier to take care of and manage and then you have it for the following years as well. And then organizing decorations if they aren't already at the end of the season when you're taking down your decorations, if you put it into a, a bin and label it Christmas decorations, it's going to make it much more easy to, to start doing in the following year. All right, meal prep. So with meal prep, you want to make sure you're planning ahead and making a list of all the things, ingredients that you might need at the store. And when you are at the store, you want to try and find some pre-made ingredients because that'll definitely save you some steps. Prep the night before if the recipe allows you to do that. And then when you're getting ready to actually start the meal prep, you want to gather all supplies first, like to the table, for example. That way you're not getting up every minute to try and find something that you forgot. Again, get help if you need it or if you can. Use of electric kitchen appliances can always be helpful as opposed to manual ones. Use of lightweight dishes is easier also to manage. And then a rolling cart in the kitchen can help transport one item to one side of the kitchen to the other side. You always want to make sure you're using a timer, especially when there's things in the oven, just so you know when they're done and you can check on them. And then setting the table the night before can sometimes help because that's one less thing you have to do the day of. All right, so family visits. If you're having family come to your house, you might want to have each family member contribute to the meal by bringing a dish and having a potluck-like meal. You want to also plan ahead and increase the space in your home as much as possible, so pushing furniture to the sides, designating walking trapping areas, as well as designating space for gifts and for food. You want to try not to get overwhelmed and stay calm if you can, but if you need to, you can take a time out by going in a quiet room or in the bathroom or somewhere where there's nobody there and just shut the door and just take a few minutes and, and deep breathe and get your bearings and then go back to what you were doing. Don't over, your, over your schedule yourself with family visits. You want to prioritize what family traditions are most important to you. And then finally, you want to watch your alcohol, al alcohol consumption and food intake. Even though this might be difficult, um, it can make you feel tired and it can also have adverse reactions if you're on certain medications. All right, traveling, I think this is the last one. So with traveling, again, you want to make lists of what you need to pack. That way when you are packing it in the suitcase, you can cross it off. Make sure you're packing ahead of time and also packing a light carry-on with all your essential items, especially your medications, just in case your suitcase were to get lost. 
If you're traveling by air, you want to call ahead of time to get accommodations for assistance navigating through the airport. Make sure you get to the airport early enough. And then consider taking a taxi or having someone drive you to the airport so that you don't have to drive there, park, walk through the, air, uh, through the airport parking lot and drag your luggage because that's a lot of energy that's needed for that. If you're tra traveling by land, you want to plan short, quick rest stops or overnight stays if needed. So if you're traveling fairly far, you might want to split up your travel into two days. And then finally, rolling lightweight suitcases are recommended so that you can transport your belongings much easier and it'll make it much more manageable. Thank you guys. <laughs> I think we're gonna have questions later, so. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to raffle off the dinner for two here at the Atlanta Marriott. And the first number is 360, you all have your numbers out? 360383. Three. Woohoo! Woohoo! We hear a woohoo. I can't scream that loud. Okay, great. I'll be with you in a few minutes. The next thing we have, we're going to do two at a time here. We have a book about multiple sclerosis. And it's 300 tips on making life easier. And that, I figured, would go great just after the conversation that Julie just had. So we are going to do that next. And again, we're mixing. Hopefully, we'll get to the other side of the room, all right? And we have number 360345. No five? No three, four, five? Do I see a hand in the back? You gotta stand, I can't see it. There's bright lights up here. There we go, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have our first two raffle winners and we'll proceed with that later on again. And in the meantime now, we're gonna have Tracy come on up. And Tracy, a lot of you already know, and from the years that I heard that she's put in at the Shepherd Center, this would be uh, fantastic. I can't wait to hear her again today. I'm going to give Tracy the mic. <clears throat> Let me get rid of my paraphernalia here. <laughs> Tracy's at the mic. Okay. Do All right. Hmm? Do you want it in there or do you want to hold I'll, it? We'll, we'll be flexible. Okay, let me get your thing up. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming and letting me fill in today. I know a lot of you were expecting a pirate with a mustache and goatee, and, and I, I really, I tried, but I couldn't fit in the pirate costume. And Stuart insisted that I shave before I come up here, so, you know, sorry. But um, hopefully we're gonna have a good time, and hopefully we'll talk about some things that maybe you're, um, wondering about and uh, you know when Dr. Thrower Down is okay thank you when Dr. Thrower talked to me about filling in for him today he was like I was like well what are you speaking on and he was like oh you know just um yeah you know, new therapies and what's going on with MS and then I get the agenda and, and it's like current therapies new therapies therapies to come and symptom management and blah 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 I'm like oh that's a lot of information so um, forgive me if we don't get into as much detail as you would like but at the end we are going to have a questions and answer um, time so if there's something you want to know more about feel free to answer I mean to ask and if I can't answer, I will research and get the answer to you. You can email Stuart and he'll get the question to me as well. So um, thank you guys again for coming. So as Stuart said, I'm a nurse practitioner. Uh, I've worked at the Shepherd Center now for 20 years. Um, I started when I was 10. So, um, but I love Shepherd Center. I'm very proud of Shepherd Center. I think it's a unique place 
we specialize in brain injury, spinal cord injury, and MS. And um, so I've been there for, for 20 years and um, with Dr. Thrower now for a little over 10. And I'm very proud of our team. I'm proud of Julie and our rehab team. I'm proud of the neurologists that I work with, Dr. Thrower and Dr. Loring. And we're going to have a new neurologist joining us in March um, from Harvard, Dr. Guy Buckle, a very well-known um, MS specialist is going to be joining us and doing some MS research with us. So we're really excited. And um, so, you know, at Shepherd, we're very passionate about what we do. Um, we're passionate about treating MS. And there's a couple of other things we're passionate about. Um, Halloween. We're very passionate about Halloween. Some of you have had the um, <laughs> opportunity to attend some of our Halloween open houses. And this is one. Um, so we have a good time and we really um, are a family. And I thank you guys for all the support that you've given Dr. Thrower and his family during this time. And I think it really has meant a lot to him. So thank you very much. So what are we gonna talk about? Well, we're gonna talk about first generation versus second generation treatments for MS. You know, where, where did we start? Where are we going? And what's around the corner? We're gonna talk about, okay, well, how do you stay on a treatment? Um, what makes a treatment successful? And then we're gonna talk about some new therapies on the horizon. Um, and then talk about MS relapses, what our treatment options are for that. And we're gonna talk about symptom management. So we got a lot to do, right? So when we talk about the medical management of MS, we kinda um, separate that into three different categories. We treat the relapses, we manage the symptoms, and then we alter the, the course of the disease. And sometimes those three areas don't always overlap. You know, so um, first we're going to talk about treating the disease and, um, you know, the bottom line that we've learned over the past 20 years is whatever you do, treat the disease, right? And the earlier you treat the disease, the better. Um, I think that we've learned is more important in a lot of cases than what you treat it with is just treat it and treat it early. So you can see with the, the slide here, the top, the blue wave is the natural course of MS. If you don't treat the disease, then disability accumulates significantly over time. If you treat the disease later, you do still slow progression of disability, you have less disability, um, but the bottom shows you if you intervene as quickly as possible, that's when you have your best, best response. So what are our goals when we're treating MS? Well, um, we definitely want to prevent or slow um, progression of disability. And I'm a hand person, so I'm gonna try to put this down because I like to see if it works. Um, can you hear me still? Okay. So we want to decrease the accumulation of disability. We want people functioning at the same level um, or close to it throughout the course of their disease. We want to prevent relapses. If we can't prevent them altogether, we want to make them mild and we want to help people recover completely from them and we want them to be very infrequent. Okay, the bottom line is we want to improve your quality of life. You know, everybody wants to have uh, improved quality of life. Um, and so to do that, we need some convenient therapies, therapies you can tolerate, therapies that fit into your lifestyle. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to repair the damage that MS does. And the good news is that's, that's happening in research right now. It's coming and it's exciting. So, um, but we want to be able to repair the damage and restore function. And we want people to have hope, hope for um, the future and uh, hope for living uh, a normal, healthy, happy life. So um, my little uh, 
diagram's not showing up real good, but I think where we're going with MS treatment now, there, the question of risk versus benefit is one of the biggest questions now. You know, when you're looking at what therapy is right for you, we have to consider the risks of that therapy and the benefits of that therapy. But we also have to consider the risks of not taking that therapy, you know? Uh, I think a lot of times we talk about the risk of a drug, but we don't balance that conversation with the risk of MS progressing if you don't take that drug or a drug, right? So it has to be a very balanced um, discussion. And, and I will say that's becoming harder and harder to do in the, in the shorter time that we have to spend with patients and discuss um, issues. And um, that's where I think programs like this are so very valuable because um, it gives us time to have discussions that we may not be able to have with you face to face, um, uh, or at least the length of time to, to have um, the whole conversation. So, what factors do we consider when we're saying, okay, what drug is best for you? Well, from a medical perspective, we want to think about your burden of disease, okay? And when we say burden of disease, we're talking about how much, um, how many lesions do you have? How much have they affected your function? Um, what's that? Um, uh, where are those lesions located? How big are they? Um, what kind of uh, issues are you having on a day-to-day -day basis right now? So burden of disease. Then we want to know how active is your disease. Many of you have heard the term enhancing lesions. Well, enhancing lesions are lesions that are actively inflamed at that moment. So when we do an MRI, we look at several different views. And we look at one view that tells us um, lesions no, long, no matter how long they've been there, right? So that kind of tells us your overall burden of disease. Then we look at the lesions that are lighting up with the dye, okay? Not all of those lesions will take up the dye. It's only lesions that are actively inflamed at that moment. You'll hear some physicians refer to that as a hot MRI or hot disease, meaning it's happening right now, we got to shut down that inflammation. So that's a big consideration when we look at what therapy we're using or if that therapy is, um, is uh, working. So, and we think about the disease course and the number of relapses people are having. Now, patient considerations, obviously y'all are concerned about all those things too. Um, I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we're, just, we're not just treating a disease scientifically, we're treating a person who needs to have a quality of life. They need to have a treatment that can fit into their lifestyle. Um, they need to, to understand what the realistic expectations of that therapy are and um, what they can expect over time. And, you know, sometimes what therapy a patient chooses has to do with things other than, you know, how you take it, when you take it, um, how well it did in research. Sometimes it depends on, you know, if you can physically do that, if you're able to get to a, a somewhere to get an infusion. If, you know, there are a lot of other things that go into that decision. So it's, it's not a easy recipe. And now as we move into a new phase of MS treatments, there are even more questions. Um, you know, we need to think about what we're choosing now and how that might affect what we choose two years from now or five years from now. You know, is that going to limit our choices? Um, so, you know, we, we talk a lot now about exit exit strategy. You know, how do you, if you start a therapy, you got to know how you're going to move to another one if you need to. So it, it, it's really becoming a much more complicated um, uh, landscape. So right now, this is the, our, our kind of landscape of MS over um, the past 15 years and moving on into the future. 
And first we're gonna talk about our first generation therapies and how those are used. Then we're gonna move into kind of the second generation therapies. And then eventually we'll talk about some of the things that are right around the corner and um, might be uh, useful soon. So our first generation therapies, or, or, or some people refer to them as our platform therapies, or the ABCR drugs, right? Um, and actually now it's ABCRE, but that's just not quite as catchy, right? <laughs> So, yeah, the, the pros, Yeah, you know, I have patients ask me, um, you know, are we still going to use those therapies? And the reality is they're good therapies. They've proven their worth um, over the years. We know they're safe. Um, we know what they do in a large population of people over a long period of time. So, um, you know, when you have real patient experience, um, not just clinical um, study experience, it makes a, a big difference. You know, we laugh all the time about how different the clinical study world is from the real world. You know, you have a select pe uh, population of people who are going into this study. They don't have any other health problems. They're recently diagnosed. They're not on all kinds of other medications. And they have a research nurse helping them through this study, right? In real life, that's a whole different ball game. So it's helpful to have that real life um, experience when you uh, have a new uh, drug come on the market. Um, we know that, you know, the ABCR drugs, they have their issues, um, but for the most part, they're pretty well tolerated for most people. So what are the cons? <laughs> That's not my chihuahua, but I have one that is the devil and looks very much like that. But anyway, it, you know, the challenge is it's hard to take injections. It's hard to take injections. But as we're going to talk about in a minute, it's hard to take medicine. I mean, I struggle even taking my calcium supplements. I mean, come on, you know, it's hard. It's human nature to struggle with that. But when, you know, with the injections, sometimes if you add on some side effects or injection site reactions, it's a, it's a big challenge. And so, you know, as providers, we need to be sensitive to that and, you know, um, and really listen to what our patients are saying. And I have to tell this story. Um, uh, one member of our team, which will remain unnamed, Colby. Um, anyway, so he, <laughs> um, years ago when he was the charge nurse in our clinic, before he became the nurse practitioner, um, uh, for some reason I think somebody had left some Copaxone um, in the clinic or something, and, and he took a shot home and he said, you know, I'm just going to see. Yeah, I'm going to take the shot. I'm going to see. It can't be as bad as all that, you know? So he pulls it right out of the refrigerator and injects it and um, spends 30 minutes running around his house screaming at the top of his lungs, which is a very hilarious picture in my mind. Um, but, you know, it, it really gave him a whole new perspective on what we're asking our patients to do. You know, and I think it's always helpful if we can step back and try to put ourselves in uh, your shoes. So, okay, with the first line therapies, okay, what do, what do we do if they didn't work or you couldn't tolerate them? Um, well, we, we had a lot of different tricks, but three of the main ones we used were Novantrone or Mitoxantrone, Cytoxin, and pulse steroids. Well, and y'all, I apologize. I have a cough, so I got my little cough drops lined up up here. Um, <clears throat> so, Novantrone um, is uh, a drug, I think it's an IV uh, chemotherapeutic type drug, and it's still used around the country some. And I know in Europe and other areas of the world, they still uh, use some Novantrone. So, some of the people who are joining us on webcast might. Uh, be familiar with that drug. Um, 
we would use that if people had a lot of that aggressive disease. Um, and, but what we learned over time was that Novantrone can have a lot of uh, heart toxicity. Um, and now if you've ever had Novantrone, you're supposed to get a yearly echocardiogram to, to make sure your heart is working okay. Um, and it can cause some leukemias. So um, as Tasabri came on the, the scene, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Tasabri, uh, our practice, we really rarely use Novantrone now um, because of those risks and because we've learned so much um, uh, about Tasabri. So um, Cytoxin is a, a chemotherapeutic drug, and it's a very interesting drug. It was used a lot um, you know, before we even had the ABCR drugs. And still, for some people, uh, we use that treatment. And it's, um, it's interesting because there seems to be a small group of people that, to, that really respond to that therapy. So sometimes we, you know, if people don't, aren't responding to typical things that we would normally put folks on, they, we may put them on cytoxin and sometimes they do beautifully. But there's a lot of lab work that has to be monitored for that as a chemotherapy drug, et cetera. Pulse steroids. Um, you know, pulse steroids, I think, sometimes can be very effective. We still use them occasionally, but long-term use of steroids can really have some serious health issues, and we're gonna talk about those in a minute. So, again, it's one of those risk-benefit kind of measurements. So, all right, we've made it through sort of our first-generation therapy, and um, we're gonna move into Tasabri and the, the oral therapies now. Um, so I think if I had um, uh, even a dime for every time somebody asked me over the past 10 years, when's the pill coming, when's the pill coming, I would be a wealthy woman. But, but the oral therapies have been very long and eagerly awaited. Um, to arrive on the MS scene. And I think one of the, the biggest issues with the oral therapies is we were all waiting for oral copaxone and oral interferon. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, those uh, were not able to be, you know, converted into oral therapy. So what we have are therapies that work in entirely different ways, okay? Um, so, and, and as we've moved into that second generation of therapies and, and learning how to manipulate the immune system in very specific ways, we've learned that um, we don't know everything we need to know about the immune system. It's very complicated. And so we're seeing that in real life, we're seeing things with uh, some of the new therapies that we didn't see in the research. So, um, but not to mean that they're not good and effective therapies that, you know, they are, and I think for some people they're, they're very helpful and um, people are doing well. Jelenia was our first oral therapy, and um, when it, it, the challenges with Jelenia, I mean, it's a once a day pill and it's a great treatment. The challenges with it is because of the way it works, it can affect other pathways in the body. So we have to be very careful to check the heart, um, check the eyes. Um, the first dosage, you have to be monitored for six hours because it can, you know, cause uh, heart arrhythmias and can cause blood pressure issues. So, um, it, you know, I think one of the challenges with Jelenia is just getting people on it, you know? You have to send them all around town and get all the reports and then uh, proceed. But um, I think for some people it can be an effective treatment. At, at our center we've had some issues with some breakthrough shingles and things like that um, with Jelenia that has, has further limited our, our use of it. But um, the next uh, oral therapy that came along is Abagio. Um, Abagio is a once a day pill as well. And um, in terms of um, general day-to-day -day side effects, I think it has, you know, people usually tolerate that fairly well. The, the issue with the Baggio is, is a couple of things. Number one, it, um, it 
It was derived from a medication that's used in rheumatoid arthritis that has, uh, you know, some significant liver function uh, abnormality. So it can affect the liver. Even though in the trials with the Baggio, it didn't seem to affect the liver as much as um, its cousin, um, the FDA said, okay, listen, you gotta be sure that people aren't having any, any liver function abnormalities with this. So you have to check liver functions every month for the first six months. Once, you know, if somebody is not having any issues with it at that point, then they're generally going to tolerate it. So sometimes that's a challenge for people to get to a lab or their doctor to get their, their labs drawn. So other folks may be on other medications that have a potential um, impact on their liver, so they don't even want to go there, you know. So that's one issue with the Baggio. The other issue with the Baggio is it's pregnancy category X. So what that means is, you know, not a good drug for women of childbearing potential. And even men, it, it can be transmitted in the sperm. So that eliminates or makes significant challenges for a large portion of our, our patient population. But it can be a really uh, good drug um, for the right person. Then the next drug that was um, uh, approved in the spring is called Tecfidera. Tecfidera is a twice a day pill, and um, um, it's something that, that we've been watching. It was studied under the name BG12, and we've kind of watched that drug and, and heard about that drug for a long time. So we were really excited about Tecfidera coming on the market. And one of the reasons is um, there, there doesn't seem to be any um, major lab work um, abnormalities. We do check, you know, uh, blood counts and liver functions periodically, but um, no major huge safety issues with that drug. Seems to be, at this point, a safe drug. Also, the, the parent compound was used in Europe for psoriasis for a number of years, and so, you, you know, you have some of that real world experience to draw from and, and make you feel a little bit more confident. What we didn't see coming with Czech Federa, although they, they, you know, in the studies, they saw that people had GI upset and they saw that people had flushing. Um, but um, I don't think we were uh, ready for the degree of that side effect. Um, and it's interesting to me that people, you know, side effects with drugs, usually people fall kind of all over the spectrum, right? They might have a little bit of side effects, or they might have a lot of side effects, but, you know, people are all over that spectrum. With Tecfidera, it's interesting because um, it's, it's almost like um, everybody's, most people are either they do fine, they don't have any side effects, or they're down here and they're like whammed with the side effects and just can't tolerate the drug. And so um, it's interesting to, to see, and, and we don't really know how to predict that, you know, who's going to tolerate it versus who's not. Um, and we, we've come up with all kind of things to try to help people tolerate it, and sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. But um, again, some people... Uh, tolerate it just fine and do really, thus far, have done really well on that drug. So, um, so we welcome the, the, uh, the opportunity to have some oral therapies for people um, who really want to, to have an oral treatment. Now the question has always been, the debate has always been, well, um, you know, are people going to be able to take a pill easier than a shot. So um, how many of you would say a shot, absolutely people are gonna take that easier? Oh, okay, all right. Well, maybe I was the only one that was shocked, but when they did the statistics on, um, of course, you know, we don't have a study where um, the, we send somebody to watch you take your pill and your, or your shot in your house, you know? So the only way we can measure whether or not people are taking their, their pills or their shots or how often you get it refilled from the pharmacy. Now, 
we know everybody has their stockpile and so that's not really a very real accurate way of measuring it but it's the best we have at this point and what they found was really in terms of they call it medication possession the injectables did a little bit better than the orals so I think really what that tells us is it, it's an individual thing you know if it, what I've found is if people are on a treatment that's working for them, most of the time they want to stay on it, you know? It's, it's usually only if they're having some of those side effects or injection issues or, you know, whatever, that, that they really um, want to make a change. Or if they're having true breakthrough disease, you know, and, um, and the uh, treatment they're on isn't working well. So, Let's talk a little bit about Tasabri. So, you know, really, in reality, Tasabri kind of fits. You could say it's first generation or second generation. You could say it's first line or second line. Um, it's it's sort of um, you know in the in between there. But um, we've learned some very valuable lessons with Tasabri. Um, you know, initially when Tasabri came out, we had no idea that there might be, you know, a brain infection related to that medicine. And, and um, we, you know, realized that, hey, you know, research doesn't tell us everything. So we've got to keep that in mind. Um, but then when Tasabri came back on the market, they came with a very excellent safety monitoring system. Um, called the touch program and the touch program keeps up with people no matter where they are in the United States tells us how many doses of Tasabri they've received they you can't administer the medicine unless you're trained through that safety program so um, so there's also been um, a couple advances in terms of um, monitoring the safety issues with Tasabri. And um, I'm not going to get into the whole, uh, you know, explanation of things, but um, Tasabri is a once a month infusion and it, it, in rare cases can cause a brain infection that can be uh, quite serious. And that's caused by a common environmental virus called the JC virus. And probably 50, 55% of us in this room carry the JC virus around every day. We probably have no idea when we encountered it. We probably didn't have any symptoms, um, but we carry it around in our bodies. It doesn't cause us any problem. It's only when the immune system is suppressed in very specific ways that it can be a problem. And it just so happens that to Sabri, the way it works can interfere with the body's surveillance and, and um, keeping that virus uh, dormant. So we've learned, they've come up with tests now, um, two actually. One is called the JC virus antibody test. And with that test, it can tell us if you're positive or you're negative. Well, when your body encounters a virus or a bacteria, the first thing it does is it creates an antibody to that. So we can take blood and look to see if you've ever encountered the JC virus. So that's cool. If, if, if you have antibodies, then we know you're, you're, you've been exposed to that, that um, virus and you're carrying it around in your system. If you're negative, then we know you've never encountered it. So the good thing is, well, if you're negative, you can't get an infection from a virus that you don't have, right? The problem is you could still encounter it when you walk out in the parking lot today, right? So you have to kind of keep monitoring that. Also, with the test, they, there is a small false negative range. So sometimes you might get a test when you're negative and then the next one may be positive. So we repeat that test periodically to monitor. Now we know that uh, there's a new test where we can actually look at the titer levels of the antibodies. And we found that higher titer levels means people are at higher risk, lower titer levels, people are at low risk even though they are positive. So a lot of advances in terms of how to manage risk. And um, so I think that's the trend moving forward is um, how do we manage risk? How do we advise people on their risk? 
I think um, each person has their own personal uh, thought in regards to risk benefit. You know, and it, it always is interesting to see where pay people are with that. Some people will tolerate a lot of disease activity from their MS because they don't want to encounter the risk of, of something like PML. Other people um, are very into they do not want to encounter more disease progression from their MS. They have low tolerance for any changes. So they're willing to take the risk of a rare infection um, you know, to prevent that disease progression. So it is a very individualized conversation that people should be able to have with their providers. So how do you know if what you're taking is working? Well, that's probably still one of the most frustrating questions with MS, right? Um, how do we know? And you may go to one provider and ask them, how do you know my treatment's working? And you may go to another one and they have a totally different answer. And I think it, over time is how we tell. And sometimes, you know, we don't like to spend a lot of time figuring it out, but usually it takes time to tell. Um, we're going to look at those same things. Are you having relapses? Are they mild or severe? Are you recovering from them? Um, are you seeing progression of disability? Are you um, using a cane now when a year ago you weren't? You know, um, are you um, having MRI changes? Um, how many of you have felt perfectly fine, had your MRI and gone to the doctor and they walk in and say, wow, you got three enhancing lesions on your MRI. And you're like, what, what? I feel fine, you know? And probably the opposite has occurred to many of you too, where you see clinical problems and you're certain you're gonna see MRI changes. And you go in and the doctor and nurse practitioners, oh, your MRI looks great, good job. Well, wait a minute, you know? So I think that's one of the challenges that the, the um, objective tests that we have don't always correlate with the clinical presentation. So, um, so, and then I think what we need to hear from you is how do you think you're doing on the therapy in terms of is it um, tolerable? Is it something you can do and fit into your lifestyle? You know, I've had um, folks come in and not, you know, tell me they're not taking their injections. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm going to get back on it. I'm going to get back on it. And, you know, I think the bottom line is if, if, you're, if you're having real difficulty taking whatever medicine that you're on, you know, maybe you need to think about an alternative. Now that we have alternatives, maybe it's time to think about a change. So, so <clears throat> important question. What therapy is the best therapy? You know, I've spent 20 minutes going through all the different therapies for MS and, and uh, uh, to a newly diagnosed person, they're like, I don't care about all that. I just wanna, what's the best therapy? The one you'll take. <laughs> That's the best therapy. Um, seriously, you know, I think it's all well and good to look at just how effective medicines are. That's important, but we got to make sure it's tolerable, it's convenient, it's, you know, fits into your ability to, to do that treatment. And we need to be responsive to that. So why don't people take their medicines? Well, there's a lot of reasons. And um, I don't know, many of you may be like me in the audience where, you know, I tend to make things a lot more complicated than they have to be. So sometimes I'll come up with these complicated transitions, you know, okay, take one pill for a week and then take two pills for another week, then start this other one and da, da, da. And, you know, the reality is the more complex the treatment plan, the less likely people are gonna be able to stick with it, right? So we need to make it as simple as possible. I think, um, 
if people expect something from that treatment that they're not getting, then they're not going to take it. And, I, you know, I think that's one of the biggest challenges with MS is when you take these medicines, you don't feel better tomorrow necessarily. Usually, you don't feel better for a while. And sometimes you don't feel anything, but it doesn't mean it's not working. So, you know, having um, conversations with patients and having patients have conversations with one another to talk about what, it, what can I realistically expect from this treatment. Um, side effects, definitely, you know, if you can't keep a, a pill down, then, you know, that's hard to, to take it, right? <laughs> um, and then, you know, cost of medication is becoming a bigger and bigger issue. And, you know, I think um, the uncertainty of what is coming in the next two years with health care and insurance coverage and, and all of that is really looming in people's minds. And one thing I have to say that is so um, good about the U.S. and the MS situation right now is the pharmaceutical companies give a lot of free drug away. They have a lot of copay assistance programs. And I know sometimes they're not able to help people, but a lot of times they are. And, you know, I want to give them kudos for that at least. And, um, you know, hopefully that will continue. And if you are in that situation where you just found out that your insurance company, your copay on your therapy is going to be $300 a month next year, you know, call, the first thing you need to do is call that company. Call that 1-800 number that's on your medicine box and tell them. If you get that nasty letter from whatever insurance company that says, oh, well, you can't take this medicine anymore, um, you have to take this other one, call your medication company. Um, because a lot of times what that means is, well, yeah, you can, they just need to get with us and send a letter and tell them you've done well on this medicine for years. Why should we change you? So um, use, use the assistance available for you. What helps people take their medicine? Um, having a sense of ownership, a sense of control over your MS, over your treatment is so important. And I think that's one of the things I'm proudest about at Shepherd, I think we usually do a good job of letting patients um, be very involved and drive that decision-making choice in regards to their treatment. And because, you know, I've learned as a nurse over the years that if you don't believe in your therapy, it's not going to work, you know. Um, you have to have confidence in that and hope for um, effectiveness. And we talked about understanding the treatment goals, perception. The other thing that was interesting is people were more likely to take their medicine if they felt like their health care provider was supportive. Um, and so that's a, a poke at us. We need to be sure that we're um, being as supportive as we can to folks and, and um, providing adequate information on therapy. Okay, so... Now we are um, to uh, emerging therapies. What's, what is sort of around the corner? What's a little farther down the road? Um, and I think there are a lot of things. Um, it's a really exciting time to be uh, in the MS field because there is so much going on. And um, basically, we, there's um, to look through that list there, um, we have another oral therapy that's in, in research right now, Laquinamode uh, or MOD, tomato, tomato, um, <laughs> that is really an interesting drug. And right now, um, they looked at it in relapsing remitting MS, and it, although it had benefit, it, it wasn't as um, pronounced as um, they needed to be to reach their endpoint. So now they're looking at more progressive forms of MS. I think just like any other disease state, we're moving towards combination therapy. 
Um, and I think Laquina mode is that's where it's going to fit in. I think for some people it's going to be one of those things that we combine with other therapies, and that's just my personal take. Um, Alimtuzumab uh, or uh, Limtrata is a Genzyme product that's been in study for a long time, and probably many of you have heard about this uh, medication. It's an IV therapy. Um, that, and I apologize, I don't know how many days in a row, but it's given several days in a row, um, once or twice a year. And it depends on uh, the response to the medicine if it has to be redosed. Um, so that sounds nice. We have, we had three people in that trial and um, I know of at least one of those people who haven't is three years out. She hasn't had any significant relapses, hasn't had to take another dose of the medicine. So that's awesome. So, okay, what's the cons? All right, well, first of all, the infusion is difficult. I remember walking by, I, I wasn't directly involved in the evaluations of the patients after their infusions for that study, but I was walking down the hall one day and the door was open to an exam room and I'm not the most observant person in the world, so that tells you something. I, 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 out of the corner of my eye, I saw this patient with hives head to toe and I was like, Whoa! ran in there, you know, what, 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 what you're, you're having an allergic reaction, what's going on? And she's like, Tracy, this happens every time I get this medicine. I'm like, what? Um, so, um, you know, a, a, a somewhat difficult infusion to manage. Um, and then laboratory uh, monitoring, um, you have to continue to have labs monitored for, I think, two to three years after your last dose. So we're going to have to keep up with people as they move around and make sure they're monitoring um, the safety uh, labs that they need. So um, the good thing is I, it's, it's a very strong, efficacious medicine. I think there will be a niche of, of folks who really will do super well on that. Um, uh, but I don't think it will be a treatment that everybody's going to jump on. Um, we have some new and improving versions of other current therapies coming out. Um, one is pegylated interferon, and basically that is a sort of um, uh, slow release version of Avonex. So hopefully there'll be an every other week injection instead of weekly injection. Copaxone 40 milligrams is um, before the FDA right now. and. Um, it is a double dose that's given three times a week instead of daily. They took out some of the preservative, and so they say the injection site problems are much better in the new formulation, so we'll see. Um, then ocrelizumab, declizumab, those are things that are um, kind of in the same class as the um, uh, to Sabri's and, and natalizumab and all those things that they do different um, uh, ways. Rituximab, they're looking at even giving it intrathecally, <laughs> um, meaning by spinal tap. So I can't imagine that will be a real popular choice. But anyway, we'll see, right? We'll see. Okay. I think one of the most exciting things is that we're, there's a lot of research going on for progressive forms of MS, um, but both primary progressive and secondary progressive MS, um, and they're having some really good um, results. Um, at Shepherd, we did the um, T-cell natrol, and that's basically a, a vaccine where you take out a, a person's own um, T cells and they uh, treat them, make them weaker and give them back to the patient and that calms down their MS. The challenge with that trial is you have to have a certain number of those, um, you know, T cells to be able to, to do that. Now, one of the most interesting things in early research that I've heard recently is there's a, a, a man who um, has figured out how to use, instead of a person's T cells, nanoparticles and have them carry antigens into the body that decrease um, reactions 
uh, inflammatory reactions. And, and the potential for that for all autoimmune diseases is pretty staggering. It's very uh, interesting. So um, I think we're also starting to look at finally some, some of the natural um, uh, types of therapies. Um, Ida, I can't say it, Ida better known or whatever. It, it's sort of a high powered antioxidant that um, they're looking at for uh, using in progressive MS. So a lot of different varied treatments that are available. Um, now, not just drug studies going on, there's a lot of new technology that's being looked at. And um, I think, you know, um, functional electrical stimulation is in a field that's really taking off with MS. And basically what that is, is a low voltage of electricity that is applied to the body and it makes nerves work. So uh, many of you may have heard of the uh, Bioness or the walk aid for foot drop and basically it's a device that people wear and it picks up their foot. And the cool thing about FES is, you know, nerves when they don't work, if they haven't worked for a long time, they um, forget how to work. So there's a degree of re-educating that nerve. If you can get it to work again, perhaps you can teach it um, how to respond. And so some people with the Bioness or walk aid, they've worn it for several months and find that they need it less than they did before. So, um, and in therapy, they're using FES bikes um, and devices to, you know, help muscles move and walk. Um, I know at Shepherd, uh oh, what happened? Keep going. Okay. By the way, am I running out of time? Okay, so, um, so um, oh, at Shepherd they're doing a really cool thing called the exoskeleton, and I don't know if any of you saw the Atlanta Magazine and the guy who is actually walking, even though he's, um, his legs are paralyzed. So uh, really exciting technology that's coming down the, the pike. So, okay, so let's talk real quickly about how we manage relapses, okay? What is a relapse? How do you know if you have one? Well, some of you are like, I, I know that. I've had that, I know it, you know. Other people are like, sometimes I'm not sure if I'm having a relapse or what. So technical, technically we define a relapse as a new or worsened neurological symptom that occurs um, somewhat suddenly and then stays for at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, now, there, we need to make sure there's not an underlying cause. If you have a urinary tract infection or um, a stomach virus, those kind of things rev up your immune system and make you have symptoms just like relapse. So that's why when you call the doctor, they're like, well, do you have a urinary tract infection? No, I don't have a urinary tract infection. Well, are you sure? Well, so, you know, we always want you to get a specimen or whatever before we, we move forward with treatment. So um, that's something to always kind of monitor. Also, if you are exposed to excessive heat, you get overheated, you can have the same type of symptoms. So to treat a relapse or not to treat? Well, you know, research kind of, um, it, it, research is clear that when you treat a relapse, you recover more quickly if, if the treatment works, right? Um, what research isn't real clear about is, would you have recovered to the same extent whether we gave you steroids or not? And in fact, most research says, well, you probably would get to a similar level of recovery eventually, even if we didn't get the steroids. Um, so, you know, what research is very clear about is we, the best treatment for relapse is not to have them at all. <laughs> Relapses are not good, we don't want them, so we want to prevent them, right? We want to keep them from happening with our disease-modifying therapies. The most common treatment for steroids, I mean, for relapses is steroids, and um, we're talking a really high dose of steroids. So whether it's given IV or um, a really high dose of oral steroids, um, 
uh, we're talking high, high doses. And so obviously there can be um, a lot of side effects that can happen with that. Um, and some of them quite serious, you know. Um, a vascular ne necrosis can happen and people have had to have hip replacements because of, of that problem. Um, it can elevate blood sugars and uh, if you take it too many times, can give you diabetes. Um, it can cause electrolyte issues, stomach upset, um, mood changes, um, and that's a sort of a mild way to put it. Um, it can actually <laughs> cause some pretty significant issues. So cataracts, bone density issues over time. So the bottom line is we don't want to have to give you a lot of steroids. Thank you. Um, so what's the alternative? Um, well, you know, if people don't respond, well, first of all, when we're trying to choose whether we're going to treat or not, I always say is how's it impacting your function? If you can't function because of this relapse, if you can't do what you need to do, then we should consider treating it unless you have really bad side effects from treatment. So um, we have some alternatives that we can give if people can't tolerate steroids or um, if they've been treated uh, with steroids and they didn't work. Okay, so most common thing I hear is I get a little agitated on steroids. <laughs> and sometimes that's what that means. I'll never forget the first weekend I was on call and I got a call from a very upset husband whose wife was, had just completed steroids and was chasing him around the table with the plastic knife. Um, threatening to slit his wrist and and so you know it, it, you know she had to go and um, she was actually in the hospital for several days to get that out of her system so it can be some significant issues so all that to say be sure you're honest with your provider about how you react to steroids because there may be an alternative we have ACTH now which is a hormone that actually causes the body to release its own steroid so some people tolerate that much better because it's their own endogenous steroid also we think it may work in additional ways than um, uh, solumedrol or other um, exogenous steroids so um, ACTH has actually been around for years and years, but um, we're just now learning more about treating uh, relapses with that. IVIG is a blood product. It's an infusion, and uh, for some people it can, can be helpful with relapses. It's very expensive, as is ACTH, but IVIG does not have an indication for MS relapse, so sometimes it's very difficult to get that paid for. So we're going to move into symptom management really quickly. And for those of you who know me, this is my absolute favorite topic. And it breaks my heart that we can't spend the rest of the day here together talking about it. And, but maybe another time, right? Maybe Birmingham. Woo! All right. So um, lots of different symptoms that can occur with MS. Um, and many people, you know, tell me all the time, I met so-and-so, I met so-and-so with MS, and they have never had pain, and I have all this pain. Or they've never had what I experienced. So a lot of different presentations and, and options for your um, symptom experience. So fatigue, I think Julie did a great job of talking about fatigue. The only thing I would add is it is by far the most common symptom with MS. And sometimes it's the first symptom people experience. They just didn't know it was MS, right? Um, and it is significant, okay? It's, it's not what I experienced if I didn't get my sleep, you know? Um, it's an overwhelming and very debilitating debilitating problem potentially. So sometimes I think it's really important to have families involved in the discussions about fatigue and patients feel a lot of guilt about that. And um, there's a lot of mind games that go on. Am I really, do I really feel this bad? Or So um, it's a real issue. Um, cognitive dysfunction also very common with MS. The good news is it's usually mild, okay? Um, and severe cognitive dysfunction is very less common with MS. Um, the problem is if you're tired or you're depressed, it can make your cognitive function worse, which we're gonna talk more about. 
Depression, also a very common symptom with MS, and we used to think it was just because people with MS were dealing with all the issues that come along with it, right? I mean, um, but what we know now is it's actually a chemical reaction in your brain related to the disease process. It's just those chemicals get depleted from the disease process. So um, just like if your thyroid wasn't working, you would take thyroid um, you know, medicine. Um, it, you know, antidepressants are kind of in the same category. And I know people really don't like to think of them that way, but what they do is replace those chemicals that are not present if um, you're having that symptom with your MS. So if you have those three symptoms, you are not alone. I'm sure half the table probably has had them too. So um, I call them the three sisters. The three sisters are usually always together and it just depends which one's acting up the most. If it's the fatigue, if it's the cognition, if it's the depression, but they're aggravating each other all the time, right? Um, and the thing about treating those is usually you have to address all three of them, right? Or you're not gonna get anywhere. Um, and then sometimes they have an aggravating little brother. <laughs> Pain. Um, and those of you may, may recognize that sweet baby. Yes, he is my sweet baby. That's he. <laughs> but yes, he can be a pain, believe me. But pain is one of those things that when you're in pain, you can't think straight. When you're in pain, you can't help but be depressed. When you're in pain, you are tired all the time. It's amazing what energy it takes to deal with pain. And although I don't have MS, I've had some health issues where I had a lot of pain. And it, it is very frustrating. So <clears throat> please talk to your provider about managing that. The thing about managing pain with MS is it's different than managing acute pain. So many times um, narcotics and those types of drugs don't work. So there are other things that we have to use. Okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Oftentimes we use different rehab um, alternatives, medication, rest, and exercise. I know <clears throat> I tell people all the time exercise is the most effective uh, treatment for fatigue, um, but we've got to, as medical professionals, help you get off the couch to go do that. So talk to your provider so we can help you. Bowel and bladder dysfunction affects a lot of people with MS, and many of you know this is one of my favorite topics, so I won't dwell on it, though. Um, but the, the issue with bowel and bladder is it really decreases quality of life, and a lot of people don't realize that we can manage that. We can do a lot to help that. So the question is, why don't we talk about it? You know, it's like see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, you know? Um, and I think the reason is because patients um, really, thank you, patients don't realize that there is a lot of things we can do about it and maybe they don't feel comfortable talking to their doctor about that or their nurse practitioner. And so I encourage you if, if there's, you know, issues going on, talk to the nurse in the office, you know, or um, bring it up and um, they can get you to the person that really can make a difference. It's a complicated issue. They w affect each other. You have to do things in a, in a systematic way. So it takes a little time, but we can make a difference. So bladder, most common issue is that urgency frequency. And many of you have had tea today and you're probably sitting there thinking, would she please shut up? I've got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> So most common issue with MS. Um, but also you can have retention and many people don't know they're retaining fluid, right? So they don't know they're emptying their bladder or not emptying their bladder. And I'll ask them, well, do you empty your bladder? And they're like, yes, constantly. I mean, every five minutes I'm going to the bathroom or I'm having leakage. Well, sometimes what happens is the bladder's not emptying at all, and it's just the overflow that's happening. And sometimes the first clue for that is that people start having infections, urinary tract infections. So we really need to evaluate that if you've started having infections. Bowel problems you can have, most common thing is constipation, 
right? And um, there's a lot we can do about that. And, um, you know, uh, postpartum, I experienced some significant, and this is probably too much information, but let me tell you, that is not fun, okay? So we want to be able to um, help people with that. If some people can have a loss of control um, of their bowel movements, and we can help with that as well. So, <laughs> um, those of you who play golf, that one was for you, so. Um, so muscle spasticity, very quickly, um, you know, can be just a generalized stiffness or active muscle um, spasms that you can see. Um, a lot of times people with MS, um, this is what contributes to a lot of their pain. So a lot of times get, people get up in the morning and they say, it takes me, you know, 10 minutes to straighten up. Um, so sometimes we need to treat that either throughout the day, sometimes just at bedtime. PT can be invaluable, physical therapy invaluable with that. And then um, other therapies like exercise, yoga, um, acupuncture, massage therapy, those things can be really helpful as well. And with that, I would encourage you to remember, laughter is the best medicine. So please laugh every day as often as you can. Thank you. So before I get back up there in front of the microphone, did anybody lose a ring? It was in the men's room, so I know it wasn't from a woman, or it could have been. <laughs> Name what it says on it. Carlos Gonzalez, signed inside. That might seem What year was it? <laughs> Very good. That's the only thing I could read. Your ring is here, sir. Thank you. All right. So we are going to begin the question and answer period just shortly. If anybody wrote out any questions because maybe you're a little shy and you don't want to stand up and ask, that's fine. We have volunteers that are going to go around and pick these up from you. We're also going to have two people going around the room with microphones, Karen and Victoria. If they come down here and pick up the microphones, that they can go around and you can be heard. Okay, and then each presenter that answers the questions, we'll ask, we'll, we will need you to repeat those questions so that way our viewing audience can hear it as well. So, before we get into that, of course, we have to do another raffle. So, excuse me one second. Get your tickets out, right? Nobody has more than one, right? 360. Two nine one. Three six zero two nine one. By the way, I forgot to tell you what you're about to win. You're about to win a I'm not drunk, I have MS t shirt. Okay? So again I will ask three six zero two nine one. Come on down. Okay, those are over there. They're both over there. Both on the table. So, excuse me one second. This, we got to turn on. This, you got to turn on. All right. And here, do that while I'm doing that. Okay. All right. So, again, we're going to do another one for another one of these t shirts, okay? Because it got such a good laugh, why not keep going? Three six zero two four six. Two four six. Who do we appreciate? No two four six? You sure? Okay, come on now. Thank you. And we're gonna do one more real quick before we get to our final three in a little while. Thank you. This is a Donation to Maggiano's. I mean, not a donation. It's a, it's a. <laughs> you can, you will be donating when you go there. You will be giving them lots of money, I hear. But anyway, this is a uh, discount certificate for you to go to Maggiano's. All right. And um, so we're going to draw this. 
And again, I'm still wearing this guy's ring because he still hasn't made it over here. If he forgets at the end of the day, I'm going home with a new ring. But I'm going to have to explain his name on my finger. Not going to go over so good. All right, 360280. 280. 280. What's the matter? You don't want a t shirt? Or is that what I was doing? No, I was doing the uh, Magianos. Magianos. Nobody wants it? Another number. 360358. In the back. Way, way in the back. Okay, great. Come on down. All right, thank you. All right, so we have our two volunteers going out into the audience right now. This, I have to ask our presenters to come on forward. So that way you could ask some questions. Did I say I was going to do that next? Okay, good. So Tracy and Julie are come on up. You're coming in the box. Yeah, I just saw that. Am I giving you this? Yes, please. Okay. All right. I have to give you... I have to give you one of these, all right? I so, still got mine, so. You still have yours. Oops, you don't want my cell phone. <laughs> Maybe you do. All right, so this is for you. You could hold it, all right? Okay. Hold that up. Speak into the mic as well. Repeat the questions, please. And so before they go around the, the audience here to uh, pick up the uh, different questions, I have a couple of them that were handed to me. The first one is about button assistive devices. Do you have one to demonstrate? I do. You gotta speak into the mic. Okay. Do you want me to repeat the question? So the question is, with the button hook, do I have one to demonstrate? And I do. I just have to find it. <laughs> I always need that. I'm so sorry. Um, oh, here it is. Afterwards, while I give out some of these raffle things, can you read that question? Give it out, and and uh, this is for her. <laughs> it's one and one. All right, you're gonna show them. Camera zooming in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Here's one for both of you. Okay. <laughs> So it might be difficult to see, but I'll give it my best shot. <laughs> so, so, this is the button hook. So it has, I'll hold it for you, okay. It has a built up handle on it, and then it has a little piece of metal that goes around, and that's basically all it is. But you go in through the button hole, you grab the button, and then basically you're just pulling and it comes right on. And you really don't need much of your fingers, but it's kind of like sewing. So you go in through the hole. You grab the button and then you pull it through. So it is really helpful in fastening buttons. Unfastening, usually it's easier not to use this, but there is a way to do it to unfasten as well. How do you get one? Get it. Good over here. I don't need a mic. <laughs> ah. where, where can you get the button yes. You can get it on any medical website. Um, I have a specific one if you want to write it down. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can get a lot of adaptive devices on this website. Pretty much anything and everything you would ever want. Um, it's www.pattersonmedical. What, I'm so, excuse me? And if you ever come to Shepherd Center, they have some of this adaptive equipment in the gift shop, apothecary, okay. pharmacy. So. Okay, so one um, next question. Um, are timed release Ampira and Tecfidera being studied? Um, I can say that uh, they are looking at um, different formulations of Ampira in a timed release. Um, it is timed release already, but um, they're looking at a, a more lengthy um, time release version. 
and I, I saw something come across my email about that and I didn't have time to read it so I can't tell you anything more about that today but they are looking at that. Timed release tech Federa. I'm not I'm not sure about that. That's a fabulous idea. Um, but I don't know if they're really looking at that. I think um, one thing that that might help with actually is side effects more than, you know, benefit. So that would be great, but I'm not sure. Um, Julie, you just answered where can we get adaptive tools, right? I did. Okay. All right, and then this is a question about anything new with stem cells and um, their swan cells. Well, I don't know in specific. I know there's a lot of research in that arena going on. And, um, y you know, if you go on um, some of the um, uh, websites, and look at the research, there's lots of different studies happening. One of the most encouraging things that I've seen recently is, um, you know, one of the, the challenges with stem cells is getting them to become what you want them to become, you know? And I think they're making progress in terms of uh, being able to uh, identify how to encourage them to become what they need to become. And um, so a lot of technology working towards that as well. Okay, stem cell, uh, okay, cigar smoking. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are, are things in life that aren't good for us as much as we love them. And smoking is, is uh, unfortunately one of those. We've had some research in the past few years about smoking in general and it actually now looks like it's a risk factor for developing MS and then there's also a study that shows uh, people who smoke um, have more disease activity and more disease progression so um, just add that to the list of lots of, of reasons not to smoke so sorry any uh, do we have Audience questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And that helped, but mm -hmm. I'm wondering is it the arthritis is exasperating the MS? So, good question. Because I so, don't know if it really is or not. You know, I, I often talk about how, uh, you know, MS in a lot of ways is like that aggravating little brother. You know, it, it tends to um, uh, partner with some other things or conditions and then seems to magnify some stuff. Um, and then there are other things that worsen MS. You know, one of the things that I noticed that um, came out this week was about women and menopause and how um, that seems to, they both seem to make each other worse. So I think there's definitely Definitely um, uh, validity to that, and I think also, you know, with aging um, and the and the longer we we have the disease, you know, your body has something called neuroplasticity. You know, in the central nervous system, neuroplasticity is, you know, the, your brain and your spinal cord, the ability for them to um, bypass and reroute signals and continue to do what they need to do despite the damage that's there. Um, uh, 
I told my sister the other day that obviously neuroplasticity doesn't run in our family, but <laughs> I think what we do know is that as you age, you lose some of that neuroplasticity. So you start having more issues that didn't bother you before. So I um, hope that answers your question some. Sometimes you can't tell which is which. It's, it's sort of like the chicken or the egg, you know? So, okay. I think somebody's coming with the microphone. Okay, good question. So um, the first test tells you if you're positive or you're negative. We, we know now there are three risk factors with Tasabri in regards to PML. It's how many infusions you've received, if you've had prior chemotherapy or immune suppressive um, therapy, and whether you're positive or you're negative for the virus, okay? So the, um, the separation point where um, risk starts to raise for whether you're, you know, if you're positive or negative is about two years, okay? So the more infusions you have and when you get to that 24 month mark, that's when risk starts going up. Well, what they found is with this new test, if you're positive and you're at 24 months and your risk is going up, you can do this additional test called an index. The index is um, how um, much of a reaction your body's having or how much antibody is being produced. And if the index is below a certain number, what they found is even though people were positive, they were not at increased risk for up to five years. So now we can, if someone's doing really well on Tasabri and they're positive and they don't really want to make a switch, we can check that index and see where they're, you know, or uh, another way to see where they're at on that risk scale. Okay? Okay. Any other questions? Hold on back up. Re repeat that one more time. Okay, so for fatigue medication, so the question was besides amantadine, new vigil, pro vigil, and B12, is there anything else you can take for fatigue? Um, and there are uh, other things that we can try. Um, and you know, the thing about um, medications for fatigue is um, some of them really, they don't give you that body energy. They give you more of that mental alertness, you know? Um, the one exception to that may be Ampira, which if you have that nerve fiber fatigue, where if you walk or you use a nerve fiber over and over again, it gets weak. Sometimes Ampira can help with that type of fatigue. Um, there was uh, some studies looking at uh, acetyl L-carnitine, which is a dietary supplement, and I've had patients feel like that was beneficial. What they tell me is they don't see anything for a month, that they really kind of have to take that um, for a while. Um, and in terms of B12, I, I usually advise people to take a B complex because, you know, sometimes the other Bs can help raise energy levels. Um, Am I forgetting? Oh, if um, sometimes we will use the old fashioned stimulants like Ritalin and Adderall and those things. Uh, but again, you know, sometimes it, it, there's some side effects that go along with those, some challenges, and, and sometimes they're not especially helpful. Did I forget anything? Hmm? A what? A good one. 
Oh, a good goose. Oh my goodness. That's an excellent. Okay. I'm gonna give this one to Grace. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me do this. This. Oh, go ahead. Uh, we know that most of these MS medicines work through altering our immune system, and the immune system is super complicated, and um, we know the immune system is necessary in, in preventing cancer and cancer surveillance, and any drug that affects the immune system, like drugs that are used for transplant rejection, and most of these MS drugs have a potential or have been shown to, to um, be implicated in some malignancies. Not very high, very you know, minor, small percentage. But do you at the Shepherd Center treat people with MS therapy if they have a recent or ongoing malignancy? And if so, what treatment would you choose? And then you have any other information about that? Um, so that. Uh, very good question. Did everybody hear that? Do I need to repeat it? Um, so the question is, you know, with the MS treatments um, and how they affect the immune system, the immune system is also involved in preventing, you know, cancers and surveillance of the cancers, that sort of thing. And so does, do we treat MS when somebody has cancer or do, you know, and if we do with what? And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, you would think if you have MS, that should be all you have to deal with, right? That's enough. But unfortunately, some people do have other um, things happen to them. And a lot of it depends on what their treatment is for their cancer. Um, because most chemotherapies for cancer trump the MS treatments while you're on them. So meaning MS treatments, if you, if you picture a radio, it's like MS treatments kind of turn up the volume, you know, tune the, the tune you into the right station. Whereas true chemotherapy for most cancers is like taking a hammer and just smashing the radio. You know, they're getting rid of the immune system or their immune response. So many times we don't treat MS while people are receiving chemotherapy for uh, cancers. Um, now, if people have had a history of malignancies or whatever, that may impact our choice for them uh, treatment-wise currently, definitely. But that is, you know, it really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, so hopefully that semi answers your question. <laughs> I have a card. Let me let me um, do this question, and we'll go back to the audience. Are they are they close to a cure? Um, I think I think we are getting closer for sure. One of the most exciting things that is is really. Um, getting more towards the you know phase two and phase three trials are the remyelinating agents the drugs that actually uh, repair um, the, where the myelin's missing and um, there are three or four of those that i'm aware of and probably more that are in phase two and in approaching phase three trials so that's really exciting that's that's getting close to real world and if we can figure out how to remyelinate a nerve, you know, hopefully um, that may not reverse everything, but it, it, that's pretty close to a cure. I think the exciting thing is there's so much research going on, so many aspects of MS that there's no telling when we're going to have the next big breakthrough. So um, I think it's it's exciting. I personally think that we'll see it in our lifetimes. I don't. Um, you know, can't really predict exactly a time frame, so. Okay? Tracy, we've got a question back here. Yes, more of the community education seminars that I'm attending, I'm just recently diagnosed last year. I see a lot of the symptoms that are discussed are like fatigue and side effects and different things, but I've noticed that, you know, this one symptom. What is out there? What is out there for the MS patient that might be affected with the man or what's the biography? So I'm gonna let Julie answer that question. 
<laughs> okay. Um, very good question. And I will tell you, one of the funnest programs I've ever done was a few years back, Dr. Thrower and I, in Valentine's week, we did a he said, she said sex talk. And um, it, it was a really great, we had a good time, a lot of really helpful interaction. And the bottom line is sexual dysfunction is a common symptom with MS. Unfortunately, it's also common with a lot of other things too. So it's kind of like bowel and bladder. It's one of those issues that can have multi different, you know, things impacting that. Um, but there are things we can do to help with that. Um, and unfortunately, you know, us women you have to be more complicated, so sometimes the answers to our issues are not as easy, but um, there are answers, and um, so absolutely bring that up with your, your uh, provider, and you know, if they're not comfortable discussing that, then ask them to send you to somebody who would be comfortable discussing it. Another really good option is your OBGYN doctors or your urologists. Those people really specialize in that, those issues as well. So. And Tracy, you have a question? Mm-hmm. Hi, Tracy. It's good to see you. Thanks. Um, I have a question relating to the growth of myelin and stem cells. As far as the regrowth Hmm. Um, well, you know, theor there, the thing about stem cells is when, when, um, when you go to research or look at stem cells, there are lots of different stem cells and there's lots of different ways to um, get them and give them and, you know, they all have their different functions and different risks and benefits. So it's kind of a really, um, I think, too much of a complicated thing to truly get to the answer of your question. But um, obviously stem cells, why we look at stem cells is because that's where tissue grows from in the body. You know, everything came from a stem cell. So yes, I mean, Potentially, you could regrow nerves, you could regrow myelin, you could regrow a brain, maybe, you know? Um, we're not anywhere near that, but, so, but that's the, the goal with stem cells is figuring out what is the best way to get them um, and how do we tell them to do what we want them to do and then how do we put them in your body and get them to do that. So, we're getting there. Um, age affects stem cells. I'm not sure if there's an age type response to, um, I, I, I can't answer that. I don't know if there's a diminished response in terms of age. Uh, unfortunately, I suspect that there is, but <laughs> I don't know that for sure. Okay. Well, I want to have that I know she's Mm-hmm. Now, another thing I've noticed, almost all wheelchairs are either motorized or hand propelled. Now, to my knowledge, that if you don't use your muscle, you lose your muscle. I've been trying to find a uh, leg propelled pedal wheelchair, and I mean, I said for a long time. There's one in the you know, it's like $5,000, but when you get your slideshow sort of up there, for a brief moment, it looks like I thought I saw a guy with a uh, I think Julie is a great person to answer this one, so I'm going to hand it over to her. All right, so the question is, is there any type of wheelchair that is propelled by the legs? Is that your question? Okay. Um, with a manual wheelchair, you can use your legs just, you know, by taking the leg rests off and you can use your legs to propel with your arms and kind of use both. Um, and the reason that we sometimes will recommend 
manual or power wheelchairs isn't necessarily because you have to have them and you can't walk, but it's more for you know energy conservation or you know safety kind of thing. So we a lot of times we'll like patients to have both their assistive device or their walker or cane, maybe for the house, and then a walker or a wheelchair for outside the house. So you can propel the manual wheelchair with your legs too. That's not Yeah. With your heel and push right. It's totally, you know, if you're a pedal, you're using the cars and you don't right. have to do it the other way. Like I said, it's really tough. It's hard to get a grip. And you, you're doing like a third of a mile now. I don't know if it would be that fast. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you're using probably more your hamstrings when you're propelling um, a, a manual wheelchair with your legs. But and if you want to hit the quads specifically, I think getting on a you know a good home exercise program specific to quad strengthening. There's also um, a lot of there's also a lot of leg bike machines like a recumbent bike. Um, it's obviously going to work your your legs. Um, and then the FES bike that we talked about earlier with the electrical stimulation component to it is a really good way to, to exercise too with a, get, getting the cardiovascular component and the quad strengthening together. Question down in that Tracy, I was always told that if you have MS, you shouldn't take the flu mist vaccine or the shingles vaccine. Well, a couple of weeks ago I went to a presentation and the doctor said that his patients that he puts on oral medication, he gives them the shingles vaccine and he said it just depends on the medication you want. Could you lend some clarity to that? Wow. Um I haven't, I haven't heard that. That would, I, I'll need to re research that a little more. But I know that our general recommendation is to avoid live vaccines. And okay, so you know our um, our kind of thought behind that is if you're given a live vaccine that you know, really stimulates the immune system. And in some studies, people had, you know, MS activity or relapses with live vaccines. Now, there must be something deeper in terms of immune, um, you know, the me mechanisms of action and stuff that maybe they feel comfortable doing that. But um, I, I don't know about that. I'll have to research that. And I, l I know where to find you, so I'll, <laughs> I'll let you know. Mm, okay. Yeah. Question here, Tracy. I have a general question that probably is helpful for everyone. We were somewhere and I hurt my back and my husband was with me. He has MS. And the doctor that he was seeing for me said to him, What's wrong with you, buddy? And you know, we told him. And he went on this whole thing about changing the diet and the MS patients need to have less carbs, particularly no bananas, all this kind of stuff, because they're not good for patients with MS, but we can't find any real information out there that supports that, what the shepherd said about the diet and getting off the So the question is, is diet and MS. Are there specific things that affect MS make, that you shouldn't eat or you should eat or, you know, that cure MS? And I think, you know, this is a, an age-old question that's been studied, but maybe hasn't been studied in certain ways. So I, I think we're limited, really, honestly, in what we know about that. But my, my personal view, and, and I think pretty much our team um, agrees that when you, um, you know, first of all, I think nutrition affects us and all of our um, symptoms, all of our diseases, absolutely is important and affects all those things. Have we figured out for each per or for the general population a special diet that makes MS better or cures it or, or whatever? Um, and the answer to that thus far is not in any large high quality trials. Now, the Swank diet was studied extensively, and I do think he was on to something in regards to saturated fats. And obviously now we know that's bad for lots of things. Um, 
Now, there is a lot of talk about gluten and, and gluten-free diets for MS, a lot of talk about simple carbohydrates. And, you know, I personally think um, nutrition is um, as individualized as uh, the symptoms you may have from your MS. I think I may do better on more protein and less carbs or whatever, and you may do better on vegetarian, you know? I think there is an individualized component that keeps us from being able to say, you absolutely should do this diet, you shouldn't take this, da, da, da. So, I know that there are a lot of people who have differing opinions and experiences with that, and so. Other questions? Uh, yes, I was. I reading, I was reading that they might find a cold for MS with a bacteria in the intestines, two different types of bacteria. If you have one, it's so likely the cause, and if you test it on mice and to show them to be very positive. What I'm saying. Are you familiar with it? Well, I know that we're looking at a lot of different triggers for MS. So the current theory is that you, you have to have the genetic um, predisposition or ability to get the disease and that's what we've seen in genetic studies but then we believe you encounter potential triggers and I think they are identifying a lot of potential triggers and one of those may be what you're talking about um, the I think one of the biggest areas of research right now is about the gut and because the gut is very involved in immune response. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard about the, the study they did using tapeworms and um, manufacturing tapeworms and giving them to people and um, letting that go through its life cycle. And what they found was it really had a positive impact on autoimmune disorders. They looked at Crohn's, they looked at MS. So obviously the gut and um, what happens in the gut is very important. I think um, I remember a conversation I had with Dr. Thrower about, well, why would a parasite make things better? And he talked about how parasites and bacteria, there's different kind of cascades of reaction that happen and that bacteria a lot of times promotes the inflammation, whereas the parasites, you know, help do something else. So. Um, that's the extent of my knowledge in regards to parasites and bacteria and immune response. But, um, you know, they've looked at Epstein-Barr, they've looked at vitamin D levels, um, smoking, um, and, and other things that they believe are potential triggers for the disease. I think the question is, how many triggers do you have to encounter? Is there one? Is there five? Does it, you know, so it's interesting. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, yes, and, and some of the best research, so the question is, has there been research on mindfulness meditation in MS? And um, some really interesting, a huge body of research on mindfulness uh, and meditation has been done at Harvard, and basically it showed it affects everything, you know? Um, but mindfulness meditation, I think, is so uh, beneficial for so many different things. Um, and with the different um, symptoms that you have with MS, I think it really can impact those symptoms positively, you know? Um, and also, you know, we also know that stress, obviously, has a huge impact on MS. And mindfulness meditation is a great way of dealing with um, uh, stress levels in a more healthy way and, and sort of impacting their ability to ha do the bad things they do um, in MS. So um, I think it's awesome. And if you have opportunity to, to practice that and learn that, um, great. Trevor, 
Tracy. Yes. Last question. Uh, this gentleman would like to know what is the inc incident and the suicide rate among MS patients? Um, so what is what is um, suicide rate look like with MS? Unfortunately, um, there is a much greater um, risk of suicide among uh, MS patients, and um, and I. I can't remember the exact number, but I want to say it was seven times greater than general population. I'm not sure, but it's it's significant, and um, and you know I think there's a lot of um, potential reasons for that. So that's that's why when when I talk to people about depression and treating their depression um, through not just medication, but counseling and and mindfulness meditation and all the tools that are available for that it's so important because um, you know you can find yourself in a very dark place quickly and um, a, a place that you don't have to go to you know and I think this type of meeting is awesome to bring people together and to foster hope and and um, educating people on what they can do and and the experiences that you can share with one another to help with that. Support groups. Support groups, yes, very big. The one thing I would add to that is please be very honest with your providers when you see them when you're feeling that way because it might be one of the medicines that we put you on, you know? Uh, it could be something medical that you're not even realizing is going on. So be honest um, so that we can evaluate your situation and, and uh, do something about that. So I was that our okay okay. You must have been in the S magazine. There was a person who made a comment regarding all the drugs that are out for relaxing and she had a concern um, as far as the research. And I don't know that, and you may you may know that that as far as how much research was going into secondary progressive, primary progressive. I'm hopeful today because in seeing your list that you had up front, you did list the things that are out for research now, and I think you indicated one that you had indicated a positive result. Um, I'm, my question is, are you at liberty to say on the trials that are for primary aggressive um, how those are going? Positively, negative? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the issue with progressive forms of MS is it's hard to measure those in a timely way, you know? Um, progression can occur very gradually, slowly, subtly, and, you, you know, it's, it, you, when you're doing a relapsing remitting trial, you can count relapses, you know, you can see changes on MRI. So uh, progressive forms of MS have been more challenging, but I think advances in our technology, learning how to measure different kinds of changes on MRI or otherwise related to progressive forms have really um, made it possible to do good research on progressive MS. And I know that on some of the different websites, you can go on, I know uh, one, the National MS Society has a list of all the trials currently going on with progressive MS. So, and I'm sure that those kinds of lists are located other places as well. But there's a lot of research, a lot of promising research, and it's been a long time coming, and we're very happy that that's happening. So, um, I think it's all good. All right, well, thank you guys so much. Hey everybody, don't leave. Still got another four raffles to go through. I need your mic. We got another four raffles to go through and I got some great news. Aside from the fact that we have two great speakers here today and I also want to say thank you. Both of you. So, this being our first time in Atlanta, I hope that we're here 
at least a couple more times in 2014, because I think that this is a great place for us to claim as our out of Florida home. Okay, and I want to thank all of you for that as well. Also, my granddaughter was watching it on YouTube, and she wrote in, she's so happy for her pop-up. <laughs> I almost got a tear. That was good. Again, before we get into the final things going on here today, I want to again thank our sponsors. Again, it's very, very important that everybody know how much they actually do give back. They're not just making medications, and they're not what everybody comes out with and all their terminology of whatever. There's a tremendous amount of research going on to help us get to that goal that Tracy was just talking about, to hopefully, hopefully we see a cure in our lifetimes. And again, I want to thank Bayer Healthcare and Biogen IDEC, Genzyme, a Santa Fe company, Novartis, QuestCore, Teva. Did I leave anybody out? I think I said Biogen IDEC. They're there too. Biogen IDEC helped us to do the actual webcast of today's program. So I want to thank them greatly for that too. <laughs> Many noticed the temperature was going up and down in here today. Think of it as your own homes. Fight with your significant other to get the air too cool or too warm, all right? But that's what I was listening to from all of you. Well, not all of you, but many of you. I'm hot, I'm cold, it's freezing. I, come on, give me a break. Yes. I was back and forth at that thermostat and then somebody put it on heat. Who did that? Come on. All right, so. By the way, YouTube, we were just looking at, it's lit up with comments. People are actually speaking with each other while this program is going on. And that's a really great thing, and that's what we want to see. And that's what we're going to do more with our future programs, is we're going to have, I'm going to have Bill and his crew come around and, and work with us on doing live webcasts. Why? Because it's important. People are making comments that, you know, this is the type of program that they would love to see in their area, and they're not getting. I don't know where this person was, but so if we're giving it to them on webcast, then even if we're doing a program in Charlotte or New York or something, then you guys will be able to tune into this as well. So we will go forward and keep on doing these things as we can. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Polar, I gotta step out of sight here for a second. Polar cooling products. Donated to MS Views and News, a, color, a polar cooling vest. I asked them to do size large, so hopefully that'll work for whoever works out here. And then also we have wrist coolers. So, you know, if you're outside, you want to go for a stroll or whatever it is, and it's not this kind of weather, or maybe, see, I would love this in this kind of weather. But anyway, here we go. First thing, the wrist coolers. 360. 384. 360384. You have to come on up for this. Thank you. Another wrist cooler. 360271. Any 271 out there? Nobody? I guess the person that left is leaving more chance for the rest of you. We got 271? That's good. Come on down. Again, my thanks to all of you for staying here today. It was a great program. If anybody wants to know and wants to see our programs, like I mentioned earlier, you just go to our YouTube channel. If you cannot remember the URL that I said, just go to our website. Okay, and up there under uh, blogs and video, you just click on there and you can access our YouTube channel. You can also ac access all of our newsletter archives. So you go into those newsletter archives and you find uh, or you want to know about pseudobulbar effect or you want to know about fatigue, just type it into the search box, click enter, it'll show up. All the articles. So you might have too much to read. So along with this cooling vest, you have all the cooling packs. Yes, I'm mixing. You want me to hold up the bowl? I'm mixing. See? I'm mixing. And I'm smiling still. 3603. It's not you yet. 
<laughs> Let me finish the number. Three six zero three one two. Two. Do we have it? Okay, we have guy in the center here. Is that you? Perfect. All right. So we have an Android tablet here. Nobody wants that, I know. I gathered. I gathered. All right, so you'll be able to communicate better and watch for our newsletters and read all of our stuff from your bedroom. Thank you. And this is yours, too. All the cooling vests, I mean, cool packs. Thank you, sir. Good. So for the person that gets this Android tablet, you'll be able to keep up with all we do right from your bedroom. You can't complain that you can't do it. You could go out in the street as long as you have internet connection, and you can connect with us. So, did you see them all dropping? Three, six, zero, three, five, one. <laughs> there we go. Before any of you leave here today, I want to say thank you again for coming. Please remember our evaluation forms that we need, so that way we know what kind of program to bring you for the future. Again, thank you for coming down. See our people, our MSVUs and news volunteers in the back. And we thank all of you for being with us today. And our speakers as well. And everybody that I may have forgotten. Thank you very much. Bye bye. I'm smiling. I'm still smiling. Thank you.